Hi everyone, it's Ken here. In this episode, we're going to make some steel parts for the clock. I know it's been a while since I've updated this series, and I thought you all deserved an explanation. If you follow my channel, you know that I sold my desktop equipment, my Sherline mill and my Sherline lathe, and then I replaced it with a full-size uh, Tormach mill and a Grizzly lathe. But as I began using the lathe, I realized that it had a serious runout problem. This turned out to be a manufacturing defect in the lathe itself, and it couldn't be repaired on site. Grizzly was good enough to take the lathe back and refund all my money, but then I had a decision as to what to do next, and I decided to buy the Tormach Slant Pro lathe, which is a full CNC machine. Right now I'm assembling it and then I have to set it up and uh, figure out how to use it. So obviously I haven't been able to work on my clock or anything else for that matter. Since the mill was up and running I decided to cut out some of the steel parts uh, using CNC. In this case we're looking at the click spring. And uh, to cut something like this out, if you just run the end metal around the edge, uh, when it finishes its cut, the piece is just, nothing's going to be holding the, the part in place, and it's just going to fly out of here and get itself damaged. But what Fusion 360 uh, allows me to do when I'm cutting something like this is to set up uh, what they call tabs. And they're, they're just little pieces of stock that are going to be left behind so the part is still attached uh, you know, to the stock that it's being cut from. And you can specify uh, you know, where they're placed and how big they are and how tall they are and, and so forth through all these controls here. If you take a look at the tool path, you can see what's happening. As the end mill comes across, it goes up and over where there would be a tab, which of course leaves this material behind. So what I did was I went ahead and uh, ran toolpaths like this for all of the steel parts, and then I went down to the workshop and began to uh, make them. Well, let's go take a look. I started out by making the escape pallet. It's deceptive from here as to how small these parts actually are. You'll get a better feel for that when I'm handling them later. But you have to use a very, very small end mill uh, on a part this small. And one of the issues I have uh, with working with these new machines is figuring out the feeds and speeds. You know, on the small uh, Sherline equipment, you had very, very little horsepower. So everything had to move very, very slowly. And you sort of get used to that. I've been doing it for, I don't know, almost 10 years. Uh, you know, this machine is capable of going a lot faster, but if you go too fast, you're just going to snap the end mill. So dialing in that, that perfect speed, which of course varies whether you're cutting steel or aluminum or brass, um, is just really a matter of trial and error. I mean, there are calculators that get you, you know, in the ballpark, but you really have to uh, experiment with your own machine. Anyway, uh, I'm making several passes uh, to, uh, you know, at various depths uh, until I cut all the way through the part. And then at the end here, you can see uh, what the part looks like uh, with the tabs in it. Next up was making the click. The process is pretty much the same. But as I made each part, I experimented more with the feeds and speeds, looking for that uh, ideal recipe. These parts, uh, you know, certainly could have been cut out on a scroll saw, if I had a scroll saw. But uh, the problem with that is then you have a tremendous amount of finishing work to do when you're done. And uh, what you'll see is uh, using this method, um, the, the, uh, there is still finishing work that needs to be done, you know, filing and sanding, but it's uh, greatly reduced uh, by using uh, CNC to cut this part out. And then uh, next I started to make the click spring, which I'm sure is a term you've heard before. Once again, the process is the same. 
uh, it was a little tricky because it gets so thin toward the end that the uh, you have to be very careful where you place the tabs to make sure you don't uh, snap the end of the part off when you're cutting it. But uh, after a couple of tries, I got that right and uh, made my first click spring. Although I did uh, continually increase the cutting speed, uh, the video you're looking at here has been sped up just because I don't want to bore you to tears. After the click spring, I went on to make the hour hand. I couldn't find any stock thin enough, uh, so what I'm doing here is uh, thinning out the stock with an end mill uh, before I go ahead and actually cut the hour hand. Again, the process is the same. And uh, in a short period of time, we have an hour hand. Once the parts are cut out, they need to be removed from the waste stock. I find it best to trim the tabs close to the waste stock and leave them connected to the part. Once that's done, you can flip the cutters around to the straight edge portion and trim them as close to the part as possible. Next, I move the part into a small vise, and using a file, I remove the remainder of the tabs. Once that was reasonably smooth, I wrapped some sandpaper around a wooden block and sanded the part completely smooth. Eventually, I'll have to go through finer and finer grits of sandpaper to bring this to a mirror finish, but for now, I'm just trying to remove the tabs and bring the part to its final shape. It is rather difficult to hold small parts like this when you're sanding them, and I found that if you just take a couple of neodymium magnets it gives you something to hold on to and makes the process a whole lot easier. So here are the steel parts that we've made in this episode. Obviously they still need to be polished to a mirror finish and then they have to be heat treated and blued and I have to make screws and the problem is, I really don't know how to do those things, and I'm not ready to tackle that yet. I have two new machines, a lathe and a mill, that I have to learn how to use, and learning them on expensive brass and steel probably isn't the best idea. So I'm going to switch to another project for a while, one that involves strictly aluminum, while I'm learning how to use the new machines, and then I promise I'll get back to making the clock. I'll leave you with a hint as to what I'm going to make next.